Good morning, everybody. Uh, Tom Sanford here. We just wrapped up the 12th annual beginning, part one of the conservation breakfast. And I have learned that the very beginning of the presentation didn't quite record. And so with that in mind, I'd like to record this and share some information for folks that may have missed the presentation and wanted to catch the beginning. So again, my name is Tom Sanford and welcome to the 12th annual conservation breakfast. Uh, this online event is something we've been doing for a number of years to bring the community together and really share our excitement for this place and honor those that are doing amazing conservation work. Uh, we had planned on going live on April 2nd at Vern Burton, usually about 400 guests in our second largest fundraiser of the year, but instead um, we're pivoting. Um, and today we're excited to bring you the first of what's going to be three online events that are really trying to meet the same goals. You really celebrate the cutting edge conservation, restoration, environmental science and art that make the North Olympic Peninsula one of the most amazing and rewarding places to live on Earth. Um, super thankful to all of you um, for how gracious you're being through this process as we figure out the new format for things like, um, well, we need to record the beginning again. Um, I really wish we were all together in person, but hey, we gotta do what we can on behalf of this place. Um, You'll note uh, as you watch this that uh, folks are on mute the entire time and then people start using a chat room to ask questions. Uh, and so that was really proving to be a good way to use these platforms. The Land Trust has been around for about 30 years. In that time, we're really dedicated to conserving lands that sustain this community. Uh, it's about conservation of open spaces, local food, local uh, resources, healthy watersheds, recreational opportunities. And over these 30 years, there's been permanent protection of over 3,500 acres of land for our local farms, fish, and forests. We acknowledge that we uh, live and work and recreate on the traditional territories of the Sklalom and Macaw people. So we're, we're, missing, miss, we're missing seeing you all in person, uh, but do know that uh, we appreciate everyone reaching out. The Land Trust family is staying strong. Uh, uh, our staff are working from home since we've uh, been together. In fact, uh, together we purchased the 104 acres uh, at the, uh, on Town Road of River's Edge. Uh, it was a purchase in partnership with the Jamestown Squalm Tribe. And now that property will forever be uh, farmland habitat, farmland and river habitat. Uh, we're also working hard to keep our properties open to the public. That includes Seabrook Creek, Lyre, Pisht, Elk Creek Conservation Areas. We have some guidelines posted looking for folks to social distance uh, and if the parking lot's full it might be a good time to maybe take a pass and come back later. You can find directions to these properties at our website northolympiclandtrust.org uh, and together with a uh, good use we're gonna be able to keep them open for strengthening and rejuvenating um, ourselves in these in these crazy times. Uh, I know our stewardship crews are gonna be excited to get out and back on the land once we're allowed to. So now I wanna go ahead and share my screen um, while we say thank you to the sponsors that are making this possible. Sound Community Bank, NS Arbor Farms, Jamestown Squalum Tribe, customers at Sunny Farms, Natural Systems Design, Country Air Natural Foods, North Olympic Development Council, Jason and Anna Bauscher, uh, Peninsula Environmental Group, Waypoint Law, Koenig Subaru, and of course the Land Trust Alliance who have just given us a very helpful grant that's helping us bring all these events online. So here's how it works. Today we have the Cougar Research presentation you're about to see, which I, since I'm in the future, I've already seen and it's fantastic uh, with Kim Sager Fragkin. Uh, then in a week on Tuesday, May 5th, we're gonna do a very short community celebration at River's Edge on Facebook Live that just brings us all together and say, hey, 250 local families together raised over $400,000, paired that up with some state money and some other funds that are coming together. And we in the Jamestown tribe have together purchased that property. So we wanna do a little celebration. Uh, we're gonna try for some sort of like uh, online uh, toast uh, and uh, we'll see how that works. Uh, then the following week, we're gonna be doing our Outstanding in the Field Award presentation. And as we've been doing this for the last number of years, this is really a chance for us to thank those who are really the cutting edge here on the peninsula and, and sharing and, and leading um, the work of our conservation efforts. This year, we're going to honor a local artist, a local photographer who has worked all over the world um, for a number of the most 
you know, prominent uh, magazines and, 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 uh, and is just for four decades has created some phenomenal work and we're excited to share that with you. And he chooses to live right here on the peninsula. Um, the final thing I wanted to share is that at this time, one of the groups that's really struggling and not seeming to quite get the support they need from some of the other funds out there are our local farmers, farmers across the entire North Olympic Peninsula. And so what we've done in partnership with North Olympic Development Council, Jefferson Land Trust and WSU Extension is we're now all collectively accepting donations that we're gonna pool together and immediately get in the hands of local farmers. We have a very simple application process that will just get funding probably between two and $10,000 each onto some local applicants. Those farmers will then use those monies today and be expected to, to basically use those as a prepayment for food they then need to deliver to um, food banks over the next couple of years. So uh, help farmers today get fresh local food into food banks in the long haul. Uh, fundraising is happening quick and seems to be uh, really starting to work, uh, but we need all of you. And if you want to support this, go to NorthOlympicLandTrust.org, click on that orange donate button in the top corner, and that will allow you to, uh, to support this and we'll get that money off to farms. Uh, we're here within the next couple weeks. Um, with that, uh, I now have the pleasure of uh, passing this presentation on over to, uh, to Kim Sager Fragkin. And before I do so, I just want to note that 68 folks have figured out how to log into this thing. And for a first run, I think that's pretty great. Um, I think it really shows this community's dedication and I'm excited for us to take this, share it with others, share with them the future uh, events associated with this. And let's see what, what happens from here. Okay, so Kim. Um, I've known Kim for, uh, since I moved here, really, the last over 15 years. Um, and Kim, Kim sits as a board member on the Land Trust Board. Um, and I first got to know Kim when she was with Olympic National Park, now with the Lower Elwha Clown Tribe as their wildlife program manager. Kim is an astounding, world-class, cutting-edge natural scientist doing uh, cougar research, well, mammal research, and with a focus right now on a lot of cougar research here on the peninsula. And that's what she's gonna to talk to you about today. Uh, and then just the last few weeks over on KUOW, uh, their podcast, The Wild, has been featuring Kim and her team um, as they do this research on the peninsula. I really encourage you to go and check out those two separate podcasts you can find at KUOW. Um, I have to admit, it's not often I have the chance to introduce someone that a part of her job is to go up in helicopters, hang out of them looking for cougars, Go find those cougars, eventually be able to collar them and track them around. Um, I, it is just an astounding job description. Um, and so like I said, um, she's gonna talk. I would point out that um, using the word cougars, I, I personally am a big fan of the word mountain lion um, with the keyword there being lion. Uh, the one time I've seen one out in the, in the wild, uh, I can't believe I was in the presence of a, of a 10 foot long animal. Um, so, Kim's going to talk for about 15 minutes. Please make comments online um, with the chat room. Uh, I'm, stay tuned in particular for she has some videos of some different wildlife cams that I think are absolutely incredible. After Kim talks, then I'm going to come back on for just a minute, share a couple things from maybe people that came on late, and then we'll do a little Q&A with Kim that can last yeah, until it kind of runs its course. Um, and that will be today's conservation breakfast. So making sure I didn't forget anything, looking at my chat box, I think I'm good. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, pass things over to Kim. Uh, so take it away. Oh, I didn't, mention, I didn't mention the polls. So as Kim sets up, go ahead and pop on Kim. Um, feel free, uh, these polls come up, you can throw in, I think we're gonna do two or three of them. Um, throw in your answer. I'm going to do mine right now um, and uh, answer these questions and um, we'll share what, what goes on. Just a fun way to stay involved. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Can, can you guys hear me? Navara, can you hear me? Okay. Looks like I don't have video, but that's all right. Oh, there we go. I'll start my video. Okay. Okay. 
Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Tom, for that great introduction. Um, again, my name is Kim Sager Fradkin. I am the Wildlife Program Manager for the Lower Elwha Clallam Tribe here in Port Angeles. I have been with the tribe actually for a dozen years um, and primarily work on large mammals, um, both in the tribe's traditional historic treaty area, and I also work a lot on Elwha River restoration. Let's see here. My slides are not wanting to advance. Technological error, hold on one second. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay, gang, took a second. Okay, so we have many partners on our Olympic Cougar project. Um, one of the more important ones uh, that has helped us really get this program off our off its feet is Panthera, which is a large large cat research and conservation organization. Uh, we are also partnering with multiple tribes across the North Olympic Peninsula in a great effort to understand cougars across the peninsula, not just on the North Olympic Peninsula. And all of this work is funded by the Administration for Native Americans, which is a federal program under the Department of Health and Human Services. So for those of you who may be tuning in from out of the area, just to give us a sense of where we are in the state of Washington, we are out here on the Olympic Peninsula, west of Seattle and directly south of Vancouver Island. Uh, the reason that we're really interested in wildlife research is the tribe is a signatory to the Treaty of Point No Point. So in 1855, the tribe signed the treaty and began its federally recognized relationship with the U.S. government. In the treaty, the tribe retained its right to open and, um, excuse me, to hunt on open and unclaimed lands and to regulate the hunting activity of its members and ultimately to manage wildlife resource, resources, which we now share with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. So as a tribal entity, entity and a sovereign nation, we maintain our own treaty hunting ordinance and we set our own annual harvest regulations. And we have a goal to monitor wildlife populations and co-manage them with the state of Washington. And the ultimate goal of the Tribal Wildlife Program is to conserve wildlife for current and future generations of tribal members and members of the Olympic Peninsula community. So within that greater context of the Point No Point Treaty and our desire to manage wildlife for the long-term good, um, we have mostly historically studied deer and elk, but that led us to a great interest in one of the primary predators of those animals, which is the Olympic cougar. And we started an Olympic cougar project a couple years ago with three primary goals. The first one is to calculate a population estimate of cougars for the Pisht GMU. You know, it's really hard to actually count mountain lions. You can't just go out and do a survey and count them. Um, you can't go out and spotlight them from the ground. They're very elusive critters. So we are using a technique that is being used really around the world. Um, and we actually use scat detection dogs. So originally we were using a group called um, the Conservation Canines out of University of Washington. Uh, that group actually left the university and started a new group called the Rogue Detection Teams. And what this group does is they actually take the really the most unhomeable dogs that are at shelters, those dogs that we all know that are just totally crazy and fetch, fetch obsessed. And they take that energy and they train that for good. And they train those dogs to identify, find and identify uh, specific scat of different species. They also can look for butterflies and grasshoppers, but we have a team of dogs that comes out and their handlers and look specifically for bobcat and cougar scat. And the great thing about these animals is that once they find a bobcat or cougar scat, they get their ultimate reward, which is three minutes of tennis ball play, which they live for. 
So for the past two years, we have had two scat detection teams out here for 32 days a season. And one handler and one dog basically walk an area of about 16 square kilometers a day. And so they cover drainages and ridges uh, and they collect as much cougar and bobcat scat as they can while they're out there on the landscape. Uh, in 2018, they collected 207 scats for us. And in 2019, 162 scats. And so now you might wonder what on earth do we do with those scats? So in comes Cameron Macias and the University of Idaho. Cameron is a member of the Lower Elwha Clallam tribe and has been working with me as a technician for many years. And we actually wrote Cameron into our grant uh, in order to do this genetics work. And so what Cameron does is she takes that cougar and bobcat scat, she takes it back to the lab at the University of Idaho, um, where she started as a Master of Science student, but has actually converted to a PhD student. And Cameron collects, gets the DNA that is found in that scat because as animals defecate, they shed cells. And so we can actually get information on individual identities of wild animals simply by looking at their scat. It's pretty cool. So the goal there is to come up with a population estimate on the North Olympic Peninsula. The second factor or part of our Olympic Cougar project is to establish and maintain a grid of cameras across the North Olympic Peninsula to document the presence of cougars across the landscape in addition to a variety of other wildlife. So if we look at our entire point no point treaty area, so far we've been working in this smaller area, what we call the Pished Game Management Unit on the North Olympic Peninsula. We have deployed 74 cameras across this area over the last couple of years. And in 2020, we're actually expanding our camera grid eastward. So this is the close-up version of our pitched game management unit camera grid, which runs from the Elwha River to Clallam Bay. Each of these uh, blue, hot pink, and yellow dot or icons indicate a camera. And you can see that we have a little bit of a Bigfoot icon in some of these. And where the Bigfoot icon is actually indicates where we have citizen science volunteers. So we have an army of citizen science volunteers uh, that help us check cameras. They adopt a couple cameras a year and they go out and check those cameras. And as we move eastward, we will be really looking forward to um, partnering with land trusts and continuing to check cameras uh, farther east and looking for citizen science volunteers. So it allows us to, these cameras allow us to uh, collect photos, not only of cougars, but of the variety of wildlife species on the Olympic Peninsula, including deer, elk, coyotes, um, bobcats, and their kittens. And the best thing about cameras is that the animals just definitely don't know that they're there. I cannot see any of you, so I cannot see anybody smiling, but uh, yeah, sometimes the animals know that the cameras are there. Sometimes bears eat them, uh, but the wildlife seem to go about their business whether or not the camera is there. So with this camera data, we get thousands and thousands of image, images. So we are really interested in figuring out how to process those data. And with our partnership with Panthera, they have developed a, developed a program called Panthera IDS which is going to use machine learning or artificial intelligence to ultimately classify images. They have developed this program across uh, the world and we are in the process of building what we call a classifier for this program. So what we need to do is we need thousands and thousands of images of wildlife on the Olympic Peninsula. And then once we have those images, we can ultimately, our goal is to train the program to understand what, they're, what it's looking for in different images. What is a bobcat? What is a cougar? What is a coyote? What is a bear? Um, and then tell us what's in those photos. So the long range goal with the camera sampling 
is to develop methodologies where we can monitor multiple species across the landscape without having to hang out of helicopters and without having to drive around late at night shining spotlights into clear cuts. So our goal is to develop a non-invasive way to monitor a whole variety of wildlife species, which will ultimately uh, benefit the tribe and others by um, allowing the tribe to maintain subsistence harvest opportunities for current and future generations of tribal members while making sure that the wildlife populations remain stable. We're also testing new statistical models for population estimation using camera data. You don't need to worry about the details, but there are a lot of really neat models out there that will allow us to actually enumerate wildlife populations as a baseline for monitoring. So finally, our, one of the other um, main things that we do on the Olympic Cougar Project is we are looking at movement, home range, diet, and dispersal patterns of sub-adult cougars. In order to meet that goal, we actually are going out and collaring cougars to examine their movement patterns and to look at dispersal events. One of the big picture goals of looking at dispersal events of mountain lions is understanding how and if mountain lions ever get off of the Olympic Peninsula or come on to the Olympic Peninsula. We know, even before we're done with our genetic data, we know from historic hunting data that we have a lower genetic diversity on the Olympic Peninsula than in the Western Cascades, because look at us, we are surrounded by water. So there is a great interest in understanding if wildlife, especially cougars, and using cougars as an umbrella species for other wildlife, can animals get on and off the Olympic Peninsula? They have to deal with the Columbia River to the south, and bigger yet, they have to deal with Interstate 5. So this is a big question um, that's going to become bigger as Western Washington continues to grow. So to date, uh, I'm going to focus on the, collar, the cats that we have collared at Lower Elwha. We've captured and collared 13 cats. Skokomish has 18 cats on the air, and Macaw, in a study several years ago, collared 17 cats. Um, but we're going to be able to use all that data as we move forward with analysis of movement and home range. So quick map looking at the 13 cats that we have collared. Um, we have not collared anything east of the Elwha, but this just gives you a quick indication of the widespread nature of some of these cats. Um, and I'm going to break this down a little bit more. So right here, we have three dispersers. These are cats that left their moms between 14 and 18 months of age and uh, went and found their own ranges. Again, these are just the data that from the 13 animals that we've collared. So we've had three dispersers so far. One animal in the blue we called Elwha. And unfortunately, that cat um, dispersed into the hoe, came back to the Elwha, and unfortunately died of parvovirus. Uh, we have an animal that we call forest in the red stars, and he dispersed far south into the Quinault. And then a female, the yellow one, she's really stuck close to her mother. Here's an indication of the home ranges of large adult males, some overlap, but very little overlap, and females, generally smaller home ranges and a little bit more overlap. Those are adult females. And you might wonder, oh, oh, I'm not sure that the poll has gone up. Okay, there we go. I'm going to hold this map here and let you guys answer this poll. And then I'm going to move forward. So I'll just talk a little bit more about these maps while people decide what they think a cougar will eat. Um, let's go back to the main map while you all answer that poll. Um, we certainly have animals that go and use Olympic National Park. We did not capture any animals inside of Olympic National Park. But this is a lesson to all of us that mountain lions are out there. Uh, mountain lions are elusive. They do not want to interact with humans. They will generally keep to themselves um, and go about living their lives 
We need to understand that they're out there, be aware that they're out there, but do not fear them. They are among us. We all know that living on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, these data make that very apparent. All right, so I'm hoping that that gave you guys time to answer the poll. Oh yes, look at that. Beavers, deer, you guys had some good answers there. So I'm gonna close that poll and move forward. Because that poll seems to kind of mess with my ability to move around well. Now you guys have lots of time to look at this screen. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is just a quick summary. Um, this, no statistics behind this or anything, just a quick summary of what uh, many of our cougars have eaten to date. So when we look at all cougars, and this was, I haven't added the 13th cougar. Um, overall, the primary prey species on the Olympic Peninsula is black-tailed deer um, and Roosevelt elk. Uh, but when we look at the adult males in the upper right, again, this is only four individuals, but they eat, um, eat pretty much equal amounts of elk and deer, but also beavers. Beavers are pretty common um, part of a cougar's diet. They'll eat some raccoons and they'll eat other predators. They'll eat bobcats, coyotes, um, river otters. Adult females are primarily focusing on black-tailed deer and recently dispersed cougars are also primarily focusing on black-tailed deer, although um, also some elk and raccoons. So when we, what we do with our cougar data is when we see a grouping of points, we call it a cluster of points, and we go out and we look at the cluster of, we hike to the ground, uh, to the area on the ground, and if there's enough of a kill left to put a camera on it, we will, and we get some really great videos. If you have some, uh, the ability to turn your volume up, I would do that just a little to hear this female or this cat come in. So what we have here is an adult female and her young, um, this, her young, we call her Dee Dee, and the, the adult female we now have collar, we call her Gypsy. This is a roadkill elk that they're using. Um, Dee Dee and her brother Forrest have both dispersed now. And a really exciting part about our research is we're really interested in understanding how unrelated cougars or unknown cougars might be interacting with one another. It's been documented in the Tetons that cougars do interact more than we previously thought. And that's a great video of an uncollared cougar coming in and investigating the kill site of one of our collared cougars. Now listen up on this one. This is a cat we call Moses. And this is a really exciting video for us because this actually was taken in the Elwha restoration area. So new habitat since dam removal um, and a nice elk kill that he made. And he's got this cacophony of uh, frogs in the background. <clears throat> So our female uh, gypsy that we showed you, after her young dispersed, she immediately, within a few months, had new kittens. And we actually found their den by happenstance and were able to record some great video of those kittens. Uh, again, if you have your volume up, be aware, because this one is loud. Anybody who's had a baby knows that human babies are loud. Well, cougar kittens are really loud. So here they are, very happy and very vocal that their mom is back. They want to be heard. They want to be fed. And so here she is moving them to a safer den site, um, getting them out of the rain. <clears throat> Another really interesting thing that we document is every so often we have a mountain lion um, that will share its kill with a if you guys can see that skunk in the background. And we think they'll do this because they really don't want to be sprayed. Uh, the last cougar we captured actually smelled like sp skunk. And boy, they'll let you know when they're about to spray you. Here we have a skunk that's giving a warning that it's about to spray. I think it senses the camera. 
So they do this fun handstand when they're gonna spray. <clears throat> the other great thing about these kill site cameras is that we get to get a sense for all of the other animals that cougars feed. So when cougars kill larger um, prey items like deer and elk on the peninsula, they feed a lot of other critters out there. Everything from beetles on up to bobcats and eagles. We've also gotten some great video on, of golden eagles on a few of the kills. And of course, the, the largest of the scavengers around here, the turkey vulture, these guys are sunning themselves after eating off of a cougar killed elk. And the one and only animal on the Olympic Peninsula that will effectively displace a mountain lion from one of its kills is the American black bear. We have an amazing team of people that helps us get this work done. There's a lot of field work that goes on out there, um, checking in on cougar kill sites, catching cats, radio collaring cats, tracking cats. Um, so this is not fully inclusive of everybody that has helped on our projects, but this is the core, these are the core people on our team. And with that, um, you can continue to follow us on Facebook if you're interested in the Panthera Puma program. And for now, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and see if we have um, any questions. Before we take uh, any questions, I just wanted to say thank you to Kim um, that was such a fantastic presentation. Um, what an incredible talk. Um, but I do think we do, we want to turn things over to Tom just for, um, a few more minutes to finish, to finish up. And then, uh, I know we're running a little bit long, but we'll be having questions and have the opportunity to chat a little bit more with Kim. Um, so take it away, Tom. Yeah, thank you. I was desperately trying to figure out what I had done wrong on my button clicking. Um, so uh, it looks like some questions are starting to come in on the chat. Please throw them in. Um, thanks for, uh, as we figure this out, folks have stuck around. That said, the, our total number of people participating today has continued to grow. So, um, and uh, that shows me just how uh, interested we are in the amazing, amazing, captivating work of Kim um, and her crew uh, at the tribe and with Panthera. So huge, huge thank you. I also want to make sure to thank uh, Navara Carr and Amanda Anderson, the two other staff that were really uh, working uh, with me and leading this effort to bring this event online. And again, thanks to our sponsors, Sound Community Bank, NS Arbor Farm, Jamestown Sklalem Tribe, customers of Sunny Farms, Natural Systems Design, Country Air, NODC, Jason and Anna Bauscher, Peninsula Environmental Group, Koenig Subaru, Waypoint Law, and the Land Trust Alliance. Just a reminder, we've got two more of these events coming up the next two weeks. Next week on Facebook Live down at River's Edge on the ground with a quick yay community celebration of how we together have uh, helped purchase 104 acres of, uh, of amazing land uh, for future Dungeness River habitat and farmland. And then finally, uh, on May 12th, the Outstanding in the Field Award, uh, which I was hinting to later as we, uh, earlier, as we uh, honor a just astounding, um, astounding uh, local photographer, uh, well, international photographer who happens to live locally. Um, and then finally from me, just a reminder, uh, we are right now collecting funds in partnership with Jefferson Land Trust, WSU Extension, North Olympic Development Council, soon to be many, many more to create funds that we can get into farmers' hands, local farmers' hands right away that it will basically be prepayments that they then pay back through direct, um, direct uh, produce and other food goods to local food banks over the next couple of years. Uh, so go to the North Olympic website to learn more about the events. And if you'd like to give to this fund, um, just click donate. Um, it'll take you there, there'll be a button. Uh, we'll have plenty of chances to talk about helping keeping your local land conservation group up and running later. But today, let's really focus on these local farmers. So with that, I think um, this is where the formal presentation really ends, but we'll keep a Q&A process going. Um, and so uh, 
I think with that, I want to go ahead and pass this over to Navara, who can help facilitate the questions and answers. Great, wonderful. Um, let me, I'm just looking through all of the, uh, the questions. Um, there are quite a lot. Thank, thank you all for sticking around. Um, and uh, I think I wanted to start with one that has been asked uh, a few times, and it's, Kim, how do we get involved with the citizen science volunteer opportunities? Are there any? And um, especially, are there any starting on the east side uh, that may be available? Yes. Um, ex good question, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to st uh, state my email again, and it's also this presentation will be posted online, so you can find my email. But it's Kim Sager, S A G E R at lwa.org. And if you email me, uh, I can get in touch. I can get back to you and let you know when we'll be looking for volunteers. Um, one of my employees, Sarah Sandejas Zarelli, is the primary manager of the Citizen Science Volunteer Program. Um, I quickly scanned the questions as well and see that at least a few of our citizen science volunteers are on this call. Um, and so they have, I think, enjoyed their participation in the program. So you can certainly email me and we will get you involved. We are definitely moving east this summer with the help of the Jamestown and Port Gamble tribes. So yes, we need volunteers and we would love for some of you to adopt a couple cameras out there to monitor. Great. Well, that's great to hear. Um, another question, maybe what I should have started with is, do you know the, what the word is for cougar in the Elwha language? I know, I saw that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to be able to pronounce that. It's like, quick, say, I am not good at pronouncing them. I think that's my friend Suzanne. I'm going to write, I'm going to get it for her and send it to her. Yes. Fabulous. And I think that there are, um, there's like an online dictionary for the Sklaam language too that you can like click on different words and hear how it's pronounced. So um, yes. that might be a resource for people as well. Yeah, maybe we could put that on the website even. That would be fun. Let's do that. I, am, I have to admit I'm not good at speaking the Sklaam language. It's one of the things I need to, to learn. Well, I'm also terrible at languages. I'm a, an all right English speaker and not much more. Um, so the next question is, what are the different means that you go about collaring cougars? Okay, um, excellent question. So generally speaking, we, well, we use hounds. Um, so while hounds were outlawed in Washington state for cougar hunting, we do still use a team, um, a father and son team that have well-trained hounds. These are definitely conservation minded. Uh, they help with a lot of cougar research. And because it's really hard to find cougars on our own, we have a couple methods that we use before we use the hound. So let me just describe them to you. The easiest way for us to catch cougars is when it snows. So when we get snow on the Olympic Peninsula and everybody else is hunkered down at home and schools are shut and work is shut, we are heading west. And we drive a lot of the DNR and forest roads and we do something called cutting for tracks. So that is where we drive around and we look for a place where a cougar has crossed the road. And if we find a fresh cut, a fresh track, then we will bring the hounds in and release the hounds and let the dogs do their work. Um, and they will follow the cougar scent. And because cats and dogs really don't mix, um, cats don't like dogs and so they'll generally tree and they go up in a tree, the hounds are wearing radio collars as well and then we can follow along and find the cougar in a tree and then if it is safe to do so, we will load a dart with an anesthetizing drug and we will dart the animal from the tree. Um, if they're in the tree, we make an assessment before we dart on whether or not we think the animal will um, climb the tree or fall asleep in the tree. If the animal falls asleep in the tree, we send a climber up um, to safely remove the cat from the tree. But oftentimes the cat um, will climb down the tree and jump 
and then we will go find it. It usually makes it about 200 meters before the drug takes effect. Um, and then animal, animal care is our absolute priority in this situation. We know what we're doing is invasive. Um, and so we go in with a team, we're quiet, we're respectful, we monitor the animal um, and we quickly process it and put a radio collar on it. So snow tracking is one way that we find the tracks in the first place. We also use cameras. So we use cellular cameras that when an animal walks by it, it records an image. And if we get a cougar, like in the middle of the night or first thing in the morning, then we can go out with that hound team and try to find that cat. And then another way that we've caught several cats is when they prey upon radio collared ungulates. So we have a series of radio collared or a bunch of radio collared fawns and some calves. The macaw tribe has radio collared calves, elk calves. And if a cougar is determined to be a predator of one of those animals, then we can go in um, and find the cougar that way. So I really would highly recommend for those of you that are interested in this, getting on the KUOW website um, and looking at the wild podcast because they actually came out on a couple cougar captures with us. They have a bunch of great recordings and videos. There's two 30 minute podcasts that you can listen to and you really kind of feel like you're out there with us on a cougar capture. Fabulous, that's great to hear. Um, so another question we got is about um, the satellite property um, east of Wheel Road. And um, what is the cougar population around that area? Um, and if you have any detail, more details about um, the, the cougars there. Yeah, and I can certainly communicate with that family directly. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely have cats that use that property. We are so thankful for the access. So thank you for allowing us to access that property. Um, one of the primary cougars that we had using that area, unfortunately lost his radio collar. Uh, he, we called him Apollo. He was the first cat we caught on the project. Um, by the way, we named them like hurricanes um, alphabetically and we're up to Moses. I've never in my life named study cats, but it's just easier to keep track of them this way. So Apollo used that property a lot, um, but we also have a couple females um, in Wang Yang Disperser that use that property. So at least three cats that are using that area. Great. Um, so how do cougars get parvo? We think it was probably from a domestic source. Um, parvo lives in the soil for a long time. And that cat Elwa, when he dispersed, um, he spent time in human dominated areas. Uh, he, we had caught him in the Elwa when he was still with his mother. Um, and once he left her, he used Indian Valley a little bit and he used the lower Elwa watershed um, near some of the farms there. And he also went out the hoe outside the park. So we think that he probably actually picked it up in the soil. We don't think he killed a domestic animal. We think he picked it up in the soil. Um, and unfortunately, it, it killed him. We had a, a necropsy done. We got in an unlucky situation. We got lucky enough that when we found him and um, he died, we were able to freeze him and wait until the National Park Service veterinarians were here for mountain goat capture last year. And so we had two professional wildlife veterinarians that did the necropsy and we sent a bunch of samples to the lab and determined cause of death. It was surprising. Yeah. We were not accepting it. Wow. Um, and then do you have any uh, information about like population trends of cougars on the peninsula um, just generally? Not yet, but that is what we aim to get. Um, I can say that in the beginning of our project, we really felt like we were dealing with a low density population. We were having a hard time finding cougars in the first year. Um, we were feeling like there were fewer than we were expecting. Um, since then, we've definitely ramped up. And now that we have 13 collared, we're getting a better sense for the population. But the results of the genetic work are ongoing. Cameron is dutifully working in the lab at the University of Idaho um, and will ultimately be able to give us a population estimate and trends, it can take a while to understand trends. We need the estimate first, and then we need to continue to monitor with cameras um, in order to look at any trend data. Right, absolutely. Um, just a couple more questions we have. Um, so 
uh, why does the why do bears displace the cougars um, on kill sites? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, they are often larger, and cougars often won't put up a fight for their kills. They will kill smaller animals, so we've had them kill bobcats and coyotes at their kill sites, but they don't want to tangle with a bear. So when a bear comes in and takes over, oftentimes the cougar just won't come back. Okay, and then um, unless there are other questions, um, it looks like the last couple are related to um, videos. So how did you get the videos of the babies in the den? What an uh, incredible video. Yeah, that was pure luck. Um, so Andy Stratton, who's one of our Panthera, um, one of the Panthera employees, who's just a really motivated uh, young field guy, he went hiking into one of our, what we call the clusters. So these are concentrations of GPS points where we think there's a kill site. He went into one of Gypsy's clusters thinking she had a kill site and came into the brush and instead of finding a kill, he, he found kittens. And we were surprised because um, her, young, um, her young cats had dispersed maybe three months before. So we weren't expecting her to have kittens already. Uh, and so it was pure luck. <laughs> so he put the cameras up because we always carry cameras and he got all that great footage. Great. Sorry, just a couple more, I think. That's okay. Um, how do you keep track, how do you track the collared lions, particularly in heavy, heavily forested areas? Great question. So the GPS collar, uh, so the collars have two types of capability. They're GPS, so they have global positioning system units on them. And the callers attempt to access GPS satellites uh, every two hours. Um, some of the callers that we have, we even have them trying to get locations every hour. So when and if the caller is able to get three satellites, it records the location and saves it in the caller. It triangulates using satellites, saves the location, and then once a day, those data are transmitted through the Iridium satellite system and transmitted to our computer so we can see where the cats have been. So that is one way. So we get, the, we get the data, we get the points on a map, and then we can look at the points and get the tight locations of where an animal has been hanging out and hike out there. And if we wanna know if the cougar is there at the time, the callers also have VHF capability. So that's very high frequency. And we can go bring kind of our old school radio telemetry gear out. Um, and I hold up, like I'm holding an antenna. And so this uh, uh, um, emits a beeping sound, a beep, beep, beep. And then we know if the cougar is actively in the area. Um, and what if we're dealing with a cat in the area, then you know we might respond differently to hiking into the kill site. Right. So, you know, I just back to the dense, the denseness. You know, when I studied bears 15 years ago on the Olympic Peninsula, we had very poor success with getting GPS coverage. Like we didn't get a lot of good coverage, but right now the collars are so good um, that often even when the cats are in really dense areas, somehow they are accessing satellites and we're able to get locations of cougars, even in dense habitats. Wow, it really goes to show how, how much technology has improved. Yeah. Um, uh, last couple, um, so, we were going to have this as a poll, but um, if if we do come across a cougar in the wild, what should we do? You should not run. Um, if you come across a cougar in the wild, you should consider yourself lucky. First of all, first off, um, it's not that common to encounter one. For the most part, they do not want to tangle with humans. They are afraid of us. They are trying to get away from us. Um, I used to be absolutely terrified of cougars. I admit it. I was really scared when I first moved here. Um, and I'm not that frightened anymore. I have, a, I have a great deal of respect for them and their capabilities. Um, but if you encounter one, do not freak out. Do not run. Um, make yourself look large. If you have children, pick them up. If you have a coat, wave it over your head. Yell, clap, throw sticks. And if it's persistent, then you need to back away, um, but you need to not turn your back on it. But it's, it's rare, it's rare to have an encounter with a, um, a persistent cougar that wants to attack. It, it can happen, 
um, but it's exceedingly rare. So look large, do not run, make a lot of noise. Great, that is good to know. Um, and then just to, to wrap things up, I did just want to reiterate to folks that, um, you know, we did record this and we'll be posting that online at a later, at a later time. So folks will be able to um, rewatch this entire presentation, including the videos, which were really just incredible, such amazing things to get. And then also, Kim, is there a way that we could stay up to date with the research that, that you and other folks are doing um, here on the peninsula? Is there any, any sites we can follow? Yeah, um, if you're a Facebook user or an Instagram user, we are keeping up a social, social media presence under Panthera Puma Program. Uh, so Pumas, mountain lions, cougars, they're all the same thing. So under Panthera, it's called the Puma Program. So Panthera Puma Program, on Instagram and on Facebook is a great place right now to just see videos that we post, understand when we have new cats on the air, um, and you can learn there. I also see just a quick note that I think it must be Lindsay, maybe, um, did put an audio, audio recording uh, where you can find the cougar audio recording uh, instead of me trying to butcher it online, the in Clallam, the name cougar in Clallam. Yeah. So thanks, Lindsay, for that. Well, fabulous. Thank you, Navara, for um, taking the lead on the moderation. Huge thank you to Kim for volunteering your time to be with us today. Um, I think at this point, we'd probably uh, imagine the rapturous applause coming through um, the speakers for, uh, for sharing your work with us. It is, I'm so, so thankful um, to you all. So uh, thanks to everyone. Uh, stay dedicated to this place uh, and to each other. Be strong. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get through this. Uh, um, the best way we get through things always in this community when we work together. Um, so thank you. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll call it a, a day. Take care.